States Army. I was drafted March 1968. I have it for the uh, 7th or 8th, no, 9th of March. I enlisted 24 hours before that draft. I was sent to Fort Bliss, Texas for basic training. From Fort Bliss, Texas, I went to Fort Huachuca, Arizona to be trained as a personnel specialist. I am colorblind. I could not become a grunt. That's what you call infantry. I'm also, I had a brother in Saigon at the time. By the time I finished basic training, they'd already cut my orders. So therefore, I didn't have to worry about Vietnam for a while. Or ever. I had no idea. But my brother was discharged from the service before I got out of basic training. I went to Germany, Primissance, Germany, as a clerk. Then I was transferred to the 23rd Military Police Detachment and assigned to Headquarters and Headquarters 59th Command, Permissance, Germany, where I was a personnel specialist and became a courier. A courier is an individual that carries information that's secret and above. Depending on your clearance is the type of paperwork that you will carry. Mine was secret. The Vietnam Levy. If anybody wants to know what that is, this is a thing that I call new meat. As you know, they were dying like flies at that time. I am a courier. I am now picked up the Vietnam levy that has come in. I'm now in the basement at the printing office where my platoon sergeant worked. He told me to take a standby because there's no sense in me running back. The general orders were almost finished. So I sat down. Of course, it's kind of like any place else. There's no reading material. Oh, yeah, I had some reading material. I started reading it. Now, I've been a courier for almost a year now, and I've never looked at one of these, the Vietnam Levy. The last name on the last page was my own. That was the most horrifying experience I've ever had in my life. I read my own name. Therefore, I was transferred to Vietnam. Vietnam is not even a good place to be from. Those individuals knew how to fight. For 5,000 years, they knew exactly what they were doing. You threw nothing away. Not even the tin foil from your cigarette package. If you broke something that was glass, you picked it up. The Vietnamese were very famous for what they call rocket, setting up rocket pockets. And all of a sudden, sometime, someplace, somewhere, off they come. The Vietnamese were clever enough to set up their rocket pockets during the monsoon season. That's rain, rain, rain. When the sun came out, they had a little trick sitting there for you. It was called gunpowder. The end of the gunpowder was setting, the, the fuse, was setting on the tin foil. Above the tin foil was a piece of glass. Six months later, guess what you're getting? And they're not even around. Don't ever think they were stupid. Very, very intelligent individuals. Personnel. We had good times. You made friends comrades. You had to meld. Somebody you pick on or a bunch of them. You had nothing else. Now understand, what were you doing when you were 18 years old? If you're real nice, you can say, uh, I went down and registered like I was supposed to. There is no draft anymore, people. None whatsoever. You always refer to this action as the Vietnam War. It wasn't no dang war. It was a police action, just like Korea. You got to understand, without friends, that you, mo you literally mold to these people. I became an E5 
in Vietnam, sergeant. So therefore, I was no longer allowed in the enlisted man's club. I now belong to the NCO club. Uh-uh. You'd be surprised what you can do with two bush hats. Bush hats is cover. One night. <laughs> I forgot to switch hats. And there I am, down at the EM club, the bartender. My friends are starting to come in. They happen to be the individuals that are out on the LZs that do the patrols and look for Charlie. I bought them drinks all night long. I had no problem with it. Understand the till always had whatever the cost of that was. It was always paid for. Now I had many friends too. And they knew where I was. They'd ask for favors. And of course they'd get favors. You barter. When you're in a zone like that, you learn how to barter and quickly. I would sneak cases of beer out the back door. You want that case of beer, it costs you a six dollar bill. You paid me. Three went in the till because that was the cost of the case. Three went in my pocket. And it continued buying my friends their drinks. But the payoff came. Payday. They would bring me out a can about that this big and about yay high. And they'd let the other bartenders know you keep your hands off at this Ryan's. I would probably have to change out that beer can that coffee can or whatever it was two to three times a night. It paid to make friends. They were just saying thank you. That's all they were doing. And you get to know them. You know, uh, you have a clown, his name was Sam. And, and you had a quiet one, maybe his name was Ron. And uh, all of a sudden you come in and say, uh, Hey guys, where's Ron? Well, you know where Ron is now, don't we? Ron ain't coming back. I wonder how many of us veterans have asked the question, would we have been better off coming home in the pine box? Most of you people are not old enough to know exactly what happened to the Korean and the Vietnam vets when they came home. Baby killer? Spit on? The United States government turned their backs on us. It wasn't fun. It wasn't pretty. But you got to understand, we came from a generation. You take your hits and continue on. February of last year, I became an ungodly, uncontrollable anger that you would not believe I am in the veterinary uh, hospital in Cheyenne. They have a telehealth in Rollins. So we set up an appointment to find out what the heck the wrong. What comes about in something like this is the question that the psychologist asked. How did you suppress that for 45 years? And how come it came to the surface now? I buried a veteran, my wife's brother. It wasn't pretty. You made friends. You did the best you could. I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. Everybody wants to know how I can keep a job. It wasn't hard. We were taught, when I and your generation, my generation, take your lumps and carry on. That's not hard. But when something like that happened, when you're close to an individual, and all the friends start talking about him, guess what comes to the surface? Do you want us like not to dream? I don't dream. Why? Don't suppose it's something that happened in Vietnam, do you? I don't think it was what happened in Vietnam as much as it was the reception I got when I came home. All of us feel that. But we all went on. And you ask the question here today, why, after 50 years, are you trying to KMA? You can figure out that increment all by yourself. The biggest problem I have today, especially today, is I have to question 
Why are we in Afghanistan? Why are we over there trying to buy magic carpets? Why are we sticking our noses into somebody else's business that we have no right to do? What happened to Bangkok? Oh, excuse me, I went Bangkok. I'm in the wrong country already. What happened? Sothosa. Puss, main. All right. I can get this out if I really try. They went right back to what they were doing before we got there. You got to understand, folks, these people are tribal. They're tribal. There is no such thing as a presidente. There's no president. The kids are going through the same hell in a different set of circumstances than we did. It's very, very heartbreaking for me to look at a Korean veteran and know they were treated the same as I. But they carried on too. They're before me. They're another generation. You got to understand, folks, no matter where you are, there is something that is going to trigger something that happened. I used to fly around on a flat fast team. For those of you who don't know what a fast team is, it's when a personnel specialist grabs a typewriter in one hand and your Mattel in the other. Oh, that's an M16, excuse me, in the other hand. And you are on a Chinook helicopter. The belly of that helicopter is opened because slung from its belly is a cargo container. That cargo container is now en route to my favorite place, LZ Liz. For those of you who don't know what an LZ is, it's called a landing zone. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's where the grunts, infantrymen, base camp. That's where they took off to do all of their recon. You're sitting up there, and on the flight over, you can see down, oh yeah, and all of a sudden you see white puffs. Can you imagine what those white puffs are? Small arms fire. And guess where their target is? You're sitting in it. The only thing that's uh, saving grace is not only do we have a daggum uh, cargo container on the belly, which is metal, we might be too high to hit. It does not give you a warm fuzzy, let me tell you. Now let's get on the LZ. We are now on the LZ. You're talking to these people. What are you doing with a typewriter on an LZ? And their records. I think you can figure it out. Are they going to survive? Is everything in a row? If you don't think war isn't pretty, let me tell you, it isn't. You lose your friends. There are some people that lost their life because they were injured so bad. Am I lucky? Or should I have come home in a pine box and I wouldn't have to look at this anymore? We had fun. We had to have fun. We made fun. But that's not what shows anymore. It's not fun. It's the treatment. The I don't give a damn. War is war. A conflict is nothing. It's sticking your nose in where it doesn't belong. When you go to war, the object of war is so you can maintain the way of life that you are used to. So some of us have got to go out and sacrifice so that you can maintain that way of living. And we do. And we do it gracefully. We do it with honor. We do it for our nation. Now what did our nation do for us? I rest my case. It's not pretty. War is hell. And when you find out that you've got post-traumatic stress system, you call him a liar. He says, how did you vent your anger? 
I said, hell, I'd blow up and call you whatever I wanted to. He says, how come you kept a job? I says, I knew when to shut up. You talk about, what do you call it? It's bad when you come for words and you haven't, can't figure out what to, what to say. What do you call uh, a U.S. citizen uh, to continue and to go on? after all that happens. I'm still dedicated. I spent 22 and a half years at the Rocky Flats nuclear weapons plant. Did I get a thank you for it? I'm now fighting the Cold War. Not Vietnam. Not Afghanistan. Not Desert Storm. Korea. One or two. World War. We're now fighting the Cold War. Russia, communists. The funny story about it is you're dedicated. You want somebody to say thank you. And this is the first time I've heard thank you. And I really don't know how to take it. Should I take it with bliss or should I just shut it off again? But I can't shut it off. It's already out. There are a lot of us, just like me, with a no thank you until now. And we don't know how to perceive it. I'm 67 years old. I was 22 when I got out of Vietnam. And I've never lost a job. I've kept going. But I don't shut my mouth to this day. I call it like it is. But you learn just like anybody else, human beings know how to work around their handicaps. The only animal on the planet that can do it is the human being. And by golly, we did it. Thousands of us did it. Thousands of us are now finding out we got a problem and it's hiding. God bless you, Vietnam vets. You did a good job.